we uh, when Intimate when Intimate um, started as a cost action, uh, it's many years ago now. Um, Chris Turney was the was the lead on the application, and he proposed that we should have an online presence in Second Life. And it it you know it never happened. Uh, we wrote it out of the of the final project plan. But in many ways, now we're coming back to it. It's not on Second Life, but the fact that we are now having online seminars. Um, Maybe it's 10 years late compared to what we suggested, but uh, now we are all here and now we are able to do it. And as Dirk said, let's get the best out of this now that we are actually able to meet in this way um, and, uh, and we're used to it. So I'll give a relatively short talk about um, the intimate event stratigraphy, which means that I won't go over all the details, um, obviously, because that would take all day. Um, so I'm just going to, to dive right in. Um, this is the most recent event stratigraphy part of 2014 at the end of the cost period. And, uh, you know, what makes really ice cores so, so special um, is, of course, that they are so long. We have this fantastic trade off between resolution and time span. We can cover the whole glacial period. In this case, it's from, from uh, the North Grip, Grip, and Gisp ice cores. You can see the color code. Up in the top there, very small one up here, red is grip, GISP2 is, is green and North Grip is blue. And we present the Belso 18 records in the lower of the two graphs. And we present the, the inverted log calcium concentration in the upper panel. And um, because this shows uh, climate change on a more regional level and with a much better signal to noise ratio than the isotopes. So, so we have all these these samples from ice cores, and as you can see, we have we have almost ridiculous detail. Uh, there are sixty thousand isotope samples in each of these curves. Um, there are millimeter resolution records of calcium, so we can really study what happened during the glacial in in huge detail. We have a, a, a kilometer and a half of ice core, basically times three in this graph. And this has allowed us to map out the Danske Ösker events um, with unprecedented detail. And after decades of discussion, we have arrived at this compromise on how to refer to all the events and have so they have weird names that reflect not what we would do if we did it today, but um, it reflects a backwards compatible view where all events now have names. And we hope that we have not reused any of the names that were previously given uh, in other meanings. So in that way, it's it was uh, very much a liaison exercise, trying to, to find a system that both uh, assigns names to all these very tiny faces. Some of these uh, periods are just 100 years long. I think 16.1, uh, sorry, 15.1 is one of the GI here. It's one of the, the shortest ones, just around 100 years. Um, so. We have all the things, all the events now uh, down to, to um, basically um, to what is recorded in the ice because we have all these high resolution records available from three cores. And it, it was kind of a democracy exercise also both between the people involved, but also between the records to say, okay, which, which events are large enough to get a name and which aren't. So I don't think we will change this um, anytime soon, maybe not not ever, because of course we are adding detail and new measurements and a lot of understanding is coming out as we study the DO events more. But we're not, you know, even on this scale here, this is even a core scale compared to what we do nowadays because the, the data points here are 20 year uh, averages and now people are working on much higher, much higher detail, but they're not likely to find new events uh, on the scale presented in this graph. So in, in, in that way, Probably the uh, intimate event stratigraphy is final, um, unless we, of course, come up with new explanations that that will change like, the criteria for what we regard as being an event. But what what will change though is def definitely the dating, because dating of ice cores is is not something we have sorted once and for all, even though the event names themselves may have. So I'll mostly talk about some of the remaining dating problems that we have um, in this in this talk uh, and to, to suggest uh, uh, which problems we should solve and where we're going in terms of, of ice core dating. We can discuss the events with more in the questions if there, if there are anything we should, with kind of the, that springs to mind. Uh, I'd be very happy, but I don't think it's going to, to change much. Um, and um, 
and many of you who are here were involved in the making of it. So, so I think it's it's uh, more interesting to look a little bit ahead and see where where are we going in terms of of dating these events. So when we did the ice core dating, the GICC05, Green Ice Core Chronology 2005, we counted annual layers like crazy, especially Anna Svensson, my colleague in Copenhagen. He did an amazing amount of counting. Um, I was mostly working on automated methods for counting, which mainly failed. Um, but uh, we finally produced a time scale based on a mostly manual annual layer counting approach. And here, here we see a lot of, of, uh, of uh, records. These are um, continuous flow analysis measurements from North Grip measured by our, our Bernese colleagues. And, and uh, in the Holocene, it's uh, relatively easy to, to uh, count annual layers. We'll just take a look at this section. So in, in more detail, so we have different seasonality of the species. You could say that we have a winter peak. It's not, we can't say it's C is winter, but we know that sodium is coming in in winter. And if we in, in the top of the core where we also have isotopes in high enough resolution, we can see that the, that the sodium uh, fits the, the winter um, dip in, in isotopes. So we have a winter signal, then we have a spring signal, which is the dust input uh, coming from the East Asian, from the Asian deserts to Greenland uh, here in, by the brown dust curve and the green calcium curve, which is the soft part. And then we have some, some, uh, some species that peak in summer ammonium and nitrate, uh, often also uh, sulfate. And, and we have, you know, it's a long discussion, but we have fairly good reasons to believe that we understand why there is this seasonality. Um, so we can, we, can, we, can, uh, we can map out the annual layers with pretty high precision. When the signal is like this, of course, because sometimes we, we see something that is unusual where there's kind of some small bumps hiding between the big bumps and there could maybe be another layer here. So if this is winter and this is spring and then summer comes basically on top probably, um, maybe because there wasn't so much uh, precipitation right here and then there could be another winter coming and then another uh, spring and summer peak. So then maybe there's another layer hiding here and. And we discussed for almost for years how to, to, to do this. And we arrived at this very, very uh, low practical and, and, and not very advanced solution. So to simply mark these layers as, as uh, uncertain annual layers, and then, um, and then just keep going. There are many different types of these, um, but they, and they also look different between climate phases. So here's an example, a little bit lower. It's almost the same depth, but we're just at the other side of the transition between the Younger Dries, or GS1, and the Holocene. And here you can see all the peaks uh, align. So all the impurities, they basically peak at the same time of the year. And here is the shoulder in many of the peaks. And this could be a thin layer, which is, has almost been lost. Um, due to the limited resolution of the data or simply because there wasn't enough winter snow to separate the two years or whatever. Um, but it could also just be one usual, unusual year. So we have these features and we have to sum them up in some way. Um, and that's, 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 that's the problem there. And there are many different sources of these uncertain layers. They're the shoulder layers that, that you just saw. They're faint layers, which a layer which basically has all the features, but just uh, very, very low, um, amplitude, then there could be data gaps. Sometimes we have to trim the ice core or it breaks during, during drilling. So, and we have to fill in a number of layers. And, you know, sometimes you're in doubt whether this, the gap length is consistent with, with one number or another number of annual layers. And then there could also be all kinds of weird features. You know, there are not many of those, but when you count thousands of annual layers, you once in a while find something where you just say, this is, doesn't look like anything we've seen before or something, anything we understand. Maybe some of these could be due to that snow sometimes moves around on the surface after after a snowfall. So wind redeposition, or it could be all, all other kinds of things. So we have these issues and we have to, in some way, figure out um, how do they correlate and how do we sum them? Um, and some of these are probably, some of these probably typical problems. If we make an error in one of them, you probably make an error in most of them. And others are uh, between categories, they're probably more or less um, uh, independent. So it's, it's, it's a hard question to figure out how to do this. And, you know, we, we have other problems, you know, 
you may not know, but Donald Rumsfeld, he had a, he had a period um, in his early career where he uh, did ice core dating. Uh, and let's see if the sound works. Well, it doesn't. Oh, but you know, I hope you know the clip about the known knowns and the, un the unknown unknowns and the unknown unknowns. And 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 even Donald, Donald Rumsfeld, uh, when he did ice core dating, he came to the to the to the conclusion that there are quite a lot of unknown unknowns. Um, so what we ended up doing was that we, in a very pragmatic way, just summed up all these half years. So we counted the uncertain layers as half plus minus half a year, and then summed them linearly to form the maximum counting error. And this is a very conservative approach, basically saying that the, the errors are correlated. On the other hand, on the, on the hand being uh, summing them up in a conservatory, uh, conservative way compensates for all the problems with, that we don't know. All the, for example, layers that could be lost due to wind or lost due to resolution, where we don't even have a clue that something is wrong. So this is what we did, and we knew we knew already when we did it that it was likely going to overestimate the errors. On the other hand, it's better to go above than below when it comes to estimating errors, and and this approach was at least very transparent. So you have this very large ma maximum counting error, which for some people uh, is really seen as the limit of how useful ice core records are. So, and if you compare to, for example, speleothem dates, you see the difference quite clearly because uh, uranium thorium dated speleothem records, they have very small uncertainties. This is back uh, in, in MIS-3, we're in 30 to 40,000 uh, years ago. And these are the individual error bars of the speleothem. This is Hulu record. Um, and you can see that they're, you know, they're just a few hundred years at most. While ice cores, the ice core uh, sequence has these huge error bars because we have, have inherited all the errors above where we are. So we have this problem that we have extremely high precision but low accuracy. So if we had to estimate the length of the of the of the DO events, we could do that very accurately because we know how many layers are in there. Um, so you can see the error bars down here are you know in a decadal scale. But when it comes to the absolute age, we are off, or we could be off. And this has been a problem for a long time, and people have been discussing how to deal with this. Um, and can you even do it? I mean, in the strict intimate way, we, we want to avoid correlating uh, records that, are, that we don't know show the same climate signal. Uh, and as uh, many of you old intimates, intimates know, we have been discussing this uh, fiercely in many meetings, uh, what is the likely uh, lack of the climate system? So when we see a DO event in one record, how, uh, how, um, how much of an assumption is it to say that uh, it's the same thing going on in another record. And I think a big contribution to this, I'm um, oh, sorry, I had one slide before. Uh, there are also other problems is that if you take different speleothem records, you actually get different results. So this was the, the Hulu one I just showed, but if you take other speleothem records, you actually do not get the same agreement. So maybe the urine ethereum dating is not as good as quoted. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not an expert. Maybe there's problems with un, you know, uh, dirty samples, the trial thorium, maybe it's age modeling uncertainties. I favor the last one. I think it's because we, are, we often have relatively few uh, dates in speleotherms. Um, so there's some age modeling going on and the, the growth rates of speleotherms, they vary uh, hugely. So this could add a lot of uncertainty. So Ellen Corrick, um, and uh, you know, he, she led a fantastic paper in 2020, basically trying to sort this by applying the same uh, growth modeling and the same assumptions to a lot of speleothem records and see uh, if things came together. And it did come together. So, so she kind of solved the problem about having inconsistencies between speleothem records um, and, um, and also then um, compared to, to, to Green. And this is the right plot. Uh, over here, and we should only look at this part of the plot, which is the part of the time scale, which is of our time scale, which is layer counted. Um, so, assuming that the climate is, is actually doing the same, I think the same thing, and I think we can do that because the shortest DO events are 100 years long, and they're also seen in high resolution speleothem records. So, if we assume that the lag is smaller than the event duration, I think that's a fair assumption. The, 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 an event will not start in one region after it ended in another. So there can be lacks of up to of decadal scales. I mean, let's say, let's put, let's 
put a century as the, the likely um, the likely upper limit of the real climate lags. Of course, then there are lags that could be lags inferred from records because the records do not have resolution or there could be dating problems, but the real physical climate system lag is likely to be on the Cadle scale. Uh, new models, you know, we have now have models that can do DO events and they confirm the same thing. So if we if we assume that we can align things to on the Cadle scale, we can compare the time scales and we see um, that basically there's no systematic difference. So even though we have a huge error bars back here of you know many, many hundreds, if not even a thousand years here, we actually, when we, when we compare uranium thorium dated samples from speleotherms and ice cores, assuming that the events are the same, we get basically no lag. Of course, there are lags here, but they're not systematic, showing that that it's probably more a matter of a combined combination of some small lags and some measurement resolution and stuff. It's not because we have a bias that we systematically miscounted. On the other hand, if you do the same thing and, and uh, just with Hulu Cave, and this is what Chris to Butcher did when he, they did the uh, Western Arctic Ice Sheet divide time scale some years earlier, they only used Hulu and they didn't do as careful uh, growth rate modeling because the, they could only use the published data. They found a bias. So they find a systematic difference that we're undercounting in, in Greenland by six per mil, which is not much, but it does uh, add up when you go through the, the glacial. So these these two you know results are kind of uh, a little bit in contrast with, with each other, but they don't they're not based on the exact same data. So it's not a contrast as such, but it just shows that you can get different results with with different but reasonable assumptions. And another attempt to to quantify a possible bias from the ice core dating um, is using um, the comparison of Bilbert and Tem from ice cores with carbon fourteen. Um, from other records. And, and, and Florian Adolfi did a great paper in 2018, looking into this in detail. And, and here's the match of the, one of the main features around 22,000 years ago. And you can say, you can see that, that the, the black one is the ice core based and we're matching to all the dots. And, and there can definitely be more than one possible match here. But if we, if we believe that the step here is the same, I think there's the good reasons to believe so. But there is a, quite some uncertainty, but then you get an offset of around 500 years. So this would lead to this point here. And a Chris Turney uh, Kari study here found that back at, at 31,000 years, the, the lag is much reduced. So, so um, there could be an, a, a bias in this period if this match is correct. And we've looked at that more because there's not, there are not so many data in this period, um, which is also acknowledged by Florian uh, in, in his paper. Um, so what we did was to, to, to measure more. So uh, Julia Sindel, our PhD student in Copenhagen has, has basically repeated the study of Florian uh, in this time period, uh, measuring more data and using INCAL. And it confirms that, that, that the 500 years may be a little smaller, maybe 400 years instead, but uh, there is an offset likely uh, in this period. Uh, it's, not, it's not clear cut because the records do have a lot, a lot of other signals, but the best, the best cor correlatable features that we can find show this offset. Then uh, we have new work coming up with Hai Cheng's group. So assuming that we, that we, we, can, we can find the sign of the Heinrich event, two in the ice cores, and we think we can from the dust, then that suggests a 320 year um, uh, offset around 24,000 years in the same direction that ice cores uh, have been undercounted. Um, and then we have the old Boitzert res result that I showed before the graph to the left in the previous slide, showing that, that we have an undercount of 100 to 400 years with a lot of scatter over MIS-3 and then Correct uh, contrasting result based on many, many uh, speleotherms uh, kind of drawn together and modeled in a consistent way, showing that there's no systematic bias. But it's not, uh, it was actually wrong. It says from zero to 60,000 years. That's, of course, wrong. It's actually from 30 um, because uh, uh, many of the speleotherms do not have um, Heinrich event. Uh, sorry, they don't not have a, have a stadial two. Uh, so interstadial two clearly seen and three is also sometimes thin. So it's actually hard to do the study uh, in a systematic way uh, with the very, very late and short events. 
But it shows that 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 we probably do not have a, a, a big problem with bias um, anywhere else than in the LGM. That we could be four, five hundred years, maybe a little bit less, off um, around twenty-two thousand years ago. But we're probably coming back to to uh, we're probably in some way compensating for this bias further down, which is kind of surprising because there was no there was no circularity in the argument. We didn't look at this in any way when we did the GCC. Um, break it. So we may have been wrong, uh, and then we're, so for some reason, kind of correcting the error slowly when we get further back. There's a, a relatively new paper by Feng Hei that suggests that a reason for this could be that there's maybe no winter precipitation in Greenland during the Heinrich stadials. So that could actually explain why we could be missing layers uh, during the Heinrich stadials. And, and there's a long Heinrich stadial around, you know, between the, between the the onset of, of uh, interstadial one and and 22,000 years ago. And so it is actually consistent with that we could be missing quite some layers in this period. Um, so it's good news in many ways. Um, we Even though the, the maximum counting error is large, up to several thousands of years uh, back in at 60,000, then it looks like we are actually um, pretty pretty much spot on with this, uh, with this um, period in the middle around 22,000 years being the, the odd exception um, to this rule. So this is, um, we we're then discussing how to, to, to change this because we, we, not, we don't want to make a new time scale that just fits other, you know, this, the, all these matching exercises there. I think they're useful for, for kind of investigating where we could have a problem, but it's not like we want to do a new time scale that just you know, fits these constraints. We want to count annual layers from ice cores based on ice core data. But of course, this could help us inform, inform us about where we should be uh, particularly careful and where we should look for maybe years that are only marginally captured by data. But we don't, we, we actually don't have any, any big plans to go and redo the glacial because we don't have that much in terms of new ice core data that can allow us to, to, um, to count annual layers. Uh, in the Holocene, we have, and we are working on on, uh, on uh, revising JCCO5 in the Holocene. But in the glacial, um, we don't have any new high resolution records. North Korea is still the highest resolved record in most of the glacial, so we're we're not likely to come back and uh, and redo the whole exercise without having anything uh, new to add. So maybe we'll just have to leave it here. Just st um, state and acknowledge that we may have a problem in LGM that this problem is probably slowly going away as we get deeper and then um, and then leave it at that for a while so i think it, it was maybe a bit a little bit too technical for some of you i hope you could follow and i'm happy to take questions after elisa's talk but i also hope it brought some some news to, to those of you who've followed this for for many years so thank you very much mm. Thank you, Suna, for a very nice presentation. Uh, we have some room for uh, some questions now as well, um, but you can also uh, save your questions for the discussion later. But if there's someone with, um, with a question now, then uh, feel free to raise your hand or post your question in the, in the comments. Um, we'll just see if anyone already posted a question in the comments. Not yet. Um, so is there anyone with a question for Suna right now? Not, I have a quick, oh yeah, I see a raised hand. Uh, Florian. <laughs> Hi Suna, nice talk. Thank you. Um, I know this is of course not really your cup of tea, but I'm still puzzled by that Christo using Hulu got such a different result doing the climate matching than to what Alan got, and I, I think if I see this right, Alan is also here. Do you have any guess on what makes this seemingly systematic difference between Hulu and all the other spelio themes then in terms of climate phasing? I, all I can see is I'm equally puzzled. Um, you know, I, I really liked Alan's approach of doing this in a consistent way and, and you know, re-investigating re, re some of the assumptions that go into the age modeling. But I'm not an expert myself, uh, and and I, it's, I think it's very hard to compare because unfortunately the raw data of Hulu uh, are only you know partially available, so it's hard to it's hard to really 
go into the to this to the deep matter and figure out what where the difference is. Yeah. Um, but because especially Hulu forms the basis of so many other timescales, like radio carbon timescale, and I mean, so it would be important to understand. Absolutely, absolutely. So so I'm I'm equally puzzled, and I totally agree that this is something that should be solved. But it's hard to solve without the without access to the underlying data. Is what I hear from from the people who who know who know this modeling and what to do to about it. Are there any uh, more questions for Sunim? Um, I have a quick question. <laughs> I was wondering um, to what extent do post-depositional processes such as ice melt also um, influence these last layers? Um, is that something that occurs or? or is yeah, that not, not really, not really. I mean, in, in, we have the occasional melt layer in, in, in the glacial periods. But in the glacial, the, the temperatures at the top of the ice sheet will be so low that, mm -hmm. that they're basically, you know, never any melt. There could be a little bit of summer, like super, super superficial melt, but it's, it's not something that creates, uh, you know, layers and, and will lead to loss, of, loss of, of, of layers. There's much more likely that it's wind driven. That is, if you have very low pre precipitation, just like we have in an Arctic today, where, you know, we don't have annual layering because there's simply just in many areas too little snow. And with a little, just a little bit of wind moving things around, you're mixing more than one one annual layer all the time. And I think we could have a similar situation, especially like the the Feng Hei study. So this red, it's it's a model, and and models do not get precipitation uh, very right. I mean, it's it's still in its infancy, um, but if it's if it's correct that the 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 winter snow is is largely missing during the Heinrich stadials, um, it would to mean that the, the layer thickness that needs to be mixed around by wind would be even smaller. So I think that's that's a more likely a more likely um, explanation. Uh, not not during interglacials. We have we have like North Grip. We have something like forty centimeters of snow per year. So so much does not move around. But if we're if we're in the glacial where we already down to less than half of that, and then we also lose the winter snow and it's small maybe also more windy, then then it could definitely be a um, an important factor and it doesn't take much i mean that's the whole thing we are we are talking about that we may be missing three four five hundred layers over many millennia as, as florian concluded in his paper um it's it's almost compatible with the maximum counting error so it's actually it's, it's only a little bit worse than than the features that we already have in the ice core that we found doubtful and so if we add a, a you know a handful, not more than a handful, but if we don't have to, have to add many percent, it's just a few percent of layers that could be lost um, due to due to the to the to the resolution being borderline or worse. <laughs> okay, thank you. You're um, I don't think we have any further questions. 